Hi guys, let's talk about ACTH and Addison's disease. We'll just start getting into primary Addison's disease. We'll get into secondary Addison's disease and continue that uh, discussion next week. Um, this is the fall. It's Thursday. It is week six. Here we go. So ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone, is a very important hormone because it drives the release of, of cortisol. So that's why it's important. Drives the release of ADA or of a DHEA as well, and even drives a little bit of release of aldosterone. So it's a very important hormone. It's got some AKAs: corticotropin, adrenal corticotropin. Um, but we're going to just call it ACTH. And the boards, the problem they could call it corticotropin because it's shorter. So any of these are a are fair game for boards. Remember, boards don't like to. They discourage the use of ACTH. Um, it is a member of the corticotroph family. It is secreted, therefore, by cells called corticotroph cells, which live in the anterior pituitary gland. And it is considered a member or a hormone of the HPA axis, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And it's also a member of the HP axis, the hypothalamic pituitary axis. It's involved in that whole that whole kind of chain reaction of hormones. Um, it is the only corticotroph that has an undisputed physiological role in humans. We'll look at some other ones that are some aren't understood and some there's a little dispute over. What does it do? Well, it stimulates, again, the release of cortisol and DHEA and a little bit of aldosterone. And we could go a little deeper into that. Uh, there's, the cortisol is not the only glucocorticoid released uh, from the zona fasciculata. Uh, so, but it is the main hormone when you think ACTH. The first thing that pops into my head is cortisol. Um, they are released in from the adrenal gland in the zona fasciculata, uh, by fasciculata cells, which live in the zona fasciculata. It also stimulates the release of the adrenal androgens. Um, the, the main one is DHEA or DHEAS. Or, um, yeah, those are the two main ones. Um, again, it stimulates glomerulosa cells of the zona glomerulosa to release a little bit of aldosterone. Not super clinically important, but it does. Um, let's look at pictures best sometimes. So there's a kidney, and there's the adrenal gland sitting on top of the kidney. The adrenal cortex is the outer part. Well, there's a capsule, actually. That's not shown here, but that's not clinically important. Uh, there's some secreting tissue called that makes up the cortex. Um, oh, that is. The, what did they do here? Oh, I see. So that the this orange is the uh, is the zona glomerulosa, and then the zona fasciculata is in yellow, and this inner layer of orange is the zona reticularis. This is all the adrenal cortex, though. There is a capsule uh, around the outside as well. And then the medulla, which secretes mainly epinephrine and some norepinephrine, a little bit of dopamine. We've talked about that already. This is a good slide, a good memorization slide, because it, it kind of tells you the the overall scheme of where we're going, um, how zona glomerulosa is stimulated by angiotensin II uh, and potassium concentration in the blood. And a little bit of ACH can also stimulate these glomerulosa cells to release aldosterone. ACTH also stimulates fasciculata cells in the zona fasciculata to release cortisol. Then the glucocorticoids, there's some other oddball ones we can talk about when we get into it. Uh, and ACTH also stimulates the zona reticularis, reticularis cells to release DHEA and DHEAS as well. And then there's the medulla, it's stimulated by angiotensin II and sympathetic inflow to release the catecholamines 
who are the catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. What about other corticotrophs? Maybe there's a little more controversy around these. That would be the main ones would be the melanocyte stimulating hormones, the MSH ones. Um, there are three of them. There's an alpha, beta, gamma. There's even more. There's about 10 of them. Uh, but there are three main ones. The alpha uh, is thought to be clinically significant uh, because that's the one that lives in the between the epidermis and the dermis. Uh, and that one's responsible for stimulating melanocytes to produce, to pigment carotinocytes. Uh, and carotinocytes, of, of course, that the pigment keratin gives your cells and gives your skin the, the shade of brown that you are. Uh, the more melanin that is injected into your carotinocytes, which are your skin cells, the darker you are. And we'll look at that mechanism in a while. How do you make ACE ATH? Well, then we have to back up to something called CRH, or corticotropin releasing hormone. And that stimulates the corticotroph cells, which live in the anterior pituitary, to release basically ACTH. Really something called POMC is a pre-hormone, or pro-hormone of ACTH. We'll look at that more in a second. Also, there is ADHP, which we've talked about, uh, which is parvocellular neurons also secrete a little bit of antidiuretic hormone. I put the P on there just to let you know that it came from parvocellular neurons and not magnocellular neurons. Remember ADHM or ADH from magnocellular neurons, that go, th those go down via long axons. ADH goes all the way down to the posterior pituitary, but that's not the story here as we'll see. And we just said the CRH and ADHP, they travel down to the anterior pituitary and they bind to corticotroph cells via the hormone CRHR1. Um, and that stimulates the corticotroph cells to release their juices, uh, and or at least this juice. Uh, really, it's a prohorm called POMC, a pro melanocortin is released, which is quickly acted on twice by an enzyme called PC1. Uh, that's prohormone convertase 1, which chops off its tail to create the molecule we all know and love, ACTH. All right, there is another hormone called PC2, called which is prohormone convertase 2, which lives in the skin between the epidermis and dermis. Um, that one acts only if excessive levels of ACTH uh, start floating around, like people with Addison's disease have very high levels of ACTH, so much so that it can actually get into the skin uh, right between the dermis and epidermis, because the dermis has blood vessels, so it certainly can get in there. Um, and Prohormone convertase 2 um, can act on it, as we'll see here in a second. Um, and, can, well, I guess the second is here. Uh, and convert it into alpha MSH. Alpha MSH, alpha -MSH uh, will overstimulate melanocytes. Melanocytes normally only inject a certain amount of melanin into the carotinocytes. But if MSH is around, they go crazy and they over-inject, and so you get blotchy brown skin um, like this person has. Um, she has Addison's disease, and there's way too much ACTH in the bloodstream, uh, and the ACTH has met up with PC2 in the dermal epidermal junction, and these carotinocytes or these melanocytes go cuckoo, and they just way over inject these carotinocytes, and of course carotinocytes, we've talked about that, or we will talk about them in dermatology, but I'm sure Dr. Doe has talked about those uh, cells, how they're ratcheted upward have a lifespan of about, this one is just born right here, it has a lifespan of about uh, 23 days, 24, 25 days, 
and uh, then the skin sloughs off. But these are overproduced. Uh, these melanocytes are overstimulated, so you get this blotchy brown look. Once you correct the problem, once you decrease the ACTH, the blotchiness will go away. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, CRH, uh, again, it's, uh, what kind of a word is that? It's main job. I got all kind of messed up there. Uh, is That's my voice recognition software at work. Uh, but its job is to stimulate corticotroph cells in the anterior pituitary to release POMC. And um, it's released by neurons in the parvocellular uh, or the paraventricular nuclei. Specifically, those are called parvocellular neurons, as we said. What's the difference between parvocellular neurons and magnocellular neurons? Parvocellular neurons have short little stubby axons. So they don't reach, those axons don't go all the way down into the anterior pituitary. And where magnocellular neurons, magna means big, they have big, long axons, they go all the way down into the posterior pituitary. Um, so ADH is taken all the way down where it's released from the posterior pituitary. Um, that's not the case with the anterior pituitary. We have, to, we have an intermediate carrier uh, called the hypothesial portal system. So parvocellular neurons dump into the median eminence, which is between the hypothalamus and the pituitary, uh, and the CRH gets into the hypothesial portal system and is taken quickly down to the anterior pituitary where they find their corticotroph cells and bind to CRH1 receptors. Okay, here's the story. So magnocellular neurons, uh, very, very long axon, this is the superoptic nuclei, by the way, mainly. Um, and then we have parvocellular neurons in the paraventricular nuclei, short little stubby axons. See how they have to dump into this hypothesial portal system. And then the CRH is carried down, and it into, gets into the microcirculation and feeds all these corticotroph cells. Corticotroph cells release POMC, which is converted by PC1 into AC, uh, ACTH. Right. Great. I know. I know. I hear you. Oh my God, that's so com complicated. Um, you should all. You have already had endocrinology, so you should already know this. So it should be just review. Uh, ADHP is that oddball again. Um, you probably don't know this. I don't think they go that deep into it. But parvocellular neurons, in addition to making um, CRH, they also make some antidiuretic hormone. I call it ADHP just to just to, so it doesn't get confused, but it's just ADH. Um, that also is taken down by the hypothesial portal system down to the corticotroph cells. That also binds uh, to corticotroph cells, and it helps uh, with the release of POMC, uh, which is converted into ACTH. So basically, I don't think boards really would get that deep, but you never know. Um, so ADHP basically helps with the release or the creation of ACTH. Uh, it's not a super important mechanism normally, but when you get stressed out, uh, we all know that people who get stressed out overproduce cortisol. Uh, that's because they overproduce ACTH. So this ADHP has a much greater role in stress, uh, and it drives the production of the overproduction of ACTH. Uh, what else do parvocellular neurons do? They also make TRH. They make thyrotropin releasing hormone. Here is the, that's all we'll say. We're not, we won't get into that right now. But here's kind of the overall picture. Parvocellular neurons make CRH, ADHP, um, and they stimulate corticotroph cells in the anterior pituitary via the hypothesial portal system. Uh, once they bind, the corticotroph cells make something called pro-opiomelanocortin, or POMC. PC1 cleaves it twice. Uh, there's PC1 acts on it to create a pro-ACTH, and it cleaves, on it, cleaves it again to create the desired ACTH right here. And there's other pathways. This PC1 can also make other stuff, but we won't worry about that. Um, ACTH is acted, if it gets into the skin here, uh, PC2 lives there, and it'll grab the excess ACTH, 
and convert it into alpha MSH, alpha MSH will bind to melanocytes and stimulate the overproduction of myelin, which makes the skin brown. Got it? The ACTH also will go to the adrenal gland and hit all three zones, really, but mainly it hits zona fasciculata and zona reticularis to make cortisol and DHEA, DHEA respectively. Another review slide. Some fun facts about CRH. Um, there are other CRH-containing neurons in the central nervous system. The function of these is unknown. Um, there is some CRH that's also produced by cells of the placenta, which has a critical role in delivery and pregnancy, which is way into the weeds, and you'll get that in another class. What about how is CRH regulated? That's always an important question, and I think you usually already know this, but CRH and ACTH and cortisol is regulated by a double negative feedback system. So that means that cortisol, which is the end product of CRH, the ultimate goal of CRH is to get cortisol and DHEA released from the uh, adrenal gland. And interestingly, that end product, which is cortisol, can actually turn off uh, the manufacturing of CRH and the manufacturing of ADH. So that, therefore, it's a double negative system. All right? Let's look at the picture here. So, um, so CRH, ADHP, is released from parvocellular neurons goes into the pituitary, stimulates corticotroph cells to make a POMC, which is converted by PC1 into ACTH. ACTH binds to fasciculata cells and drives the ultimate goal, the release of cortisol, which we need to, uh, amongst other things, keep our blood sugar levels stable. Once you get too much cortisol, however, that cortisol can bind to parvocellular neurons and inhibit them from making CRH and ADHP. And if just in case there's some mutation with that and it doesn't stop the production of CRH, it also binds to corticotroph cells to stop corticotroph cells from making POMC. Uh, and if you don't make POMC, you don't make ACTH. So that's a double negative feedback system. Right, and that is everything that I just said is right there for your reading pleasure. I like pictures. Now, how does stress play all into this? And this is not 100% understood, uh, but this is from Herman, 2016, so it's a pretty recent um, review of how stress drives cortisol production. Um, and yeah, it is well known. Chronic stress does increase expression of cortisol. Why? Because it increases the production of CRH and ADHP. If you overproduce CRH, you're going to drive corticotroph cells to overproduce POMC, which is turned into ACTH. And if you overproduce ACTH, that's going to bind and drive the production of cortisol uh, from the zona fasciculata. As simple as that. Now, um, stress, by, by mechanisms we don't quite understand, stress does cause corticotroph cells to grow more receptors than normal. Not for CRH, surprisingly, but it seems the receptors are for ADHP. Normally, corticotroph cells don't have a lot of receptors uh, for ADHP, and therefore plenty of ADHP is around, but it just doesn't have enough room to bind on corticotroph cells and drive the release of ACTH. Uh, but stress makes corticotroph cells sprout many, many receptors for ADHP. And therefore, now ADHP, all of the ADHP, has a place to bind. And that, that drives the overproduction of POMC slash ACTH. If you have an overproduction of ACTH, you're going to have an overproduction of cortisol, and now you start getting kind of cushiony, right? You start getting a Cushing syndrome. 
because you have an overproduction of cortisol and that causes all sorts of trouble, um, just hypertension, oh, just all sorts of trouble, as we'll study when we talk about Cushing's disease. All right, so I think this is everything I said. Um, now you can actually see the, the consequences of chronic stress by doing biopsies uh, of some of this uh, some of this tissue. If you biopsy the adrenal gland, you'll see hypertrophy or thickening of the adrenal gland, uh, name, mainly in the zona fasciculata, because of the overproduction of ACTH, which is overstimulating fasciculata cells. So they, they, they're like working out. Um, so they get bigger and they proliferate. Two weeks it takes, just two weeks of overproduction of ACTH, and you can already see histological signs of change of the adrenal gland from the over-bombardment with ACTH. Uh, the cortex, the adrenal cortex, also becomes more sensitive in general uh, to ACTH. Uh, cortisol is way overproduced and that causes all sorts of trouble. As I said, we'll get into that when we talk about Cushing syndrome. Um, now, ACTH not only drives the overproduction of cortisol, but it also drives the overproduction of the adrenal androgens, the DHEA, the DHEAS. Um, some authors say the main adrenal androgen is androstenedione. Um, so you should know that these are all kind of important molecules that are driven, their production is driven uh, by ACTH. All right, DHE is dehydroepiandrosterone. That's the way I say it. There's different ways to say it. I'm just going to call it DHEA because it's so left. That S is just a sulfate on the end. All right, some fun facts about the adrenal androgens. Um, who are the adrenal an androgens? Again, DHEA, DHEAS, and uh, androstenedione. Those are the major uh, ones, um, especially uh, in females. That's the source of female testosterone is from DHEA. We'll look at the pathway here in a second. Uh, remember, females need testosterone just like males do, but they don't have testes to make testosterone, so... This is a very important mechanism for them uh, to get their testosterone. They don't need as much as males, obviously, but they still need some. Um, let's see. DHEA, of course, is secreted by reticularis cells in the zona reticularis of the adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex. The ovaries also can produce DHEA, uh, and they secrete about 20% of the female's DHEA, and males don't have that uh, don't have that mechanism. And uh, yeah, that's part of the osteoporosis thing and why females get a little more brittle after menopause stops because they lose their ovaries. And they lose that extra 20% of DHEA. So they lose the ability to convert that into testosterone. And it's got a role in fetal development. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, Androstenedione, um, also made in the testes and ovaries as well. And that can be converted into testosterone in, for males and females. Uh, but in females, it's very important because they don't have uh, the sartori cells that make testosterone. They don't have testes. Uh, so that's yet another uh, mechanism for making testosterone. In fact, Hinmarsh uh, found that about 50% of female testosterone actually comes from androstenedione. And now some of the some of you are going, where have I heard that? Andro, Andro 500. Remember all those supplements back in the 90s and 2000s? Uh, well, there was a little science behind that. Uh, Mark Mag uh, McGuire, who broke the home one run record, announced that he was on Andro. He was taking uh, exogenous androstenedione, uh, and it was subsequently banned. Uh, by the International Olympic Committee, and it's still banned to this day because it can increase the levels of testosterone un unnaturally. Uh, but there's a problem with it, and we're going to look at that here in a second. But um, yeah, that's a way to cheat. You can get higher levels of serum testosterone uh, if you inject pretty high quantities of androstenedione, um, and that um, that's cheating, right? If you have high levels of testosterone, it allows you. It doesn't make you stronger. 
right? If you inject yourself with testosterone, you're not going to be stronger. What it allows you to do is work out way harder to build muscle naturally, but it allows you to recover way, way faster. So instead of doing a heavy squat once a week, maybe you can do it three times a week now. Um, so it allows you to build muscle, but there's still a lot of work involved with it. So in testosterone, is, uh, it makes the nerves fire faster, all sorts of benefits, but this is cheating. Um, so anyone, so we've talked about the, the bio, biochemical pathways that create, create cortisol uh, and aldosterone and DHEA. Anybody see an unwanted side effect of this androstenedione? Let's jump right to here and look. Remember we've talked about this before. Remember cholesterol is taken and basically converted. Remember it goes in to the mitochondria, out of the mitochondria, back into the mitochondria. Bottom line is cholesterol is created or is taken and you make, there's the aldosterone, there's the cortisol, and there's the DHEA. Uh, but the very important enzyme, 21-hydroxylase, is needed to make to make aldosterone and cortisol, but not DHEA. But here's the problem. Here's androstenedione. Um, androstenedione is actually a, its precursor is DHEA. So technically the, uh, the, the king of the adrenal androgens is DHEA, even though some references might use androstenedione. Um, but so if you inject androstenedione, you can see it's one step away from testosterone, right? There's a dehydrogenase, C17 dehydrogenase is an enzyme that will convert it into testosterone, and there you go. Um, and uh, yeah, protein synthesis is sped up and you know, cheating. But there's another pathway. Uh, there's aromatoase or CYP19 is another enzyme that will grab probably half of the androstenedione and convert it into estrone. And estrone is estrogen, right? That's converted easily into estradiol, which is, can be converted into estradiol. These are the estrogens. Men don't need estrogen, right? What does estrogen do? It makes breast tissue, amongst other things. So what's going to happen to people who take androstenedione? And even testosterone, for that matter. If you have too much testosterone, uh, this aromat aromatase, I can never say that right, aromatase, or we can call it just CYP19, will take that ester extra testosterone and make estrogen down here, estradiol. Guys don't need that. They're not supposed to have that. So what happens? This is what happens, right? So this bodybuilder's got little, little breasts growing here. That's called gynecomastia, and that's one of the problems of, and there's ways around that. There's other things you can uh, take. HCG, and we won't get into that, but um, yeah, so gynecomastia is a problem with that. So anyway, that's enough about that. Um, what do what does androstenedione, the DHA, do in the estrogens? What does it do anyway in females if it's overproduced? Well, if it's overproduced, you are going to make some testosterone, and testosterone is going to masculinize females. Right? They are some is going to be converted into estrogen, but you're going to have too much testosterone around if you have high levels of DHEA, because that'll be converted to androstenedione and that'll be converted into testosterone. So you'll get virulization. Make sure you know that word, virulization, um, which is masculinization. So you get breast atrophy. You get a deepening of the voice. You get hypertrichosis uh, for. So you get man-like hair. You get whiskers on your face like this female has who has Cushing syndrome. Okay. All right. Uh, no 21-hydroxylase needed. So unlike, unlike cortisol, now, well, we just said this, unlike cortisol and aldosterone, you don't need 21-hydroxylase to make the uh, to make the adrenal androgens that should be not steroids. Uh, we said this already. So 
back here, there's the point is you don't need 21 hydroxylase to make DHEA. That's the point of that there. And there's just a error on that slide. Okay, so what? Well, there's a, a deficiency that we should talk about. I think you learned it in biochemistry, but maybe not. It's an important one called 21 hydroxylase deficiency where this enzyme is broken. So if this enzyme is broken, that's not a good thing, is it? Um, because you can't make cortisol or you can't make aldosterone. Um, and that's leading us to a discussion about Addison's disease, which is usually an autoimmune attack against this enzyme. And it wrecks it, and so you have deficient cortisol and aldosterone. And plus, if, these, if this pathway isn't, if pregenolone isn't going this way, it can drive the overproduction of DHEA as well. All right. Um, what does DHEA do anyway in, in all of us humans? Uh, it's responsible. It, it wakes up uh, during puberty uh, when the adrenal androgens, uh, when the adrenal gland rake, wakes up and starts producing more DHEA. Uh, but it's responsible for some of those changes like pubic hair, axillary hair development, um, body odor, acne uh, is all directly related to the production of DHEA, uh, which starts about the age of 12 or so when uh, changes. M m little boys turn into to men and little girls turn into girls. And that process is called anarchy. Not anarchy, andrenarchy, adrenarchy. Um, and that will continue to the age of about uh, 25. So, again, some of the functions of the adrenal androgens um, are the growth of new pubic hair and body hair. And there's that famous picture of Julia Roberts went on some kick of not shaving her armpits. And um, that's what our, that's what axillary hair is, in case you don't know what that is. We all know what that is. Uh, body odor. It also stimulates the sebaceous glands to start producing sebum like crazy. And sebum can, can clog the pore, the, the canal where the hair comes out of, the follicular canal. It can clog that. And if it gets clogged, bacteria can go wild in there and you can get a uh, classic acne presentation. What about the absence of ACTH? Uh, well, if there's destruction of the adrenal gland, the, the anterior pituitary gland, maybe from a tumor, a prolactinoma got really big and crushed uh, many of the corticotroph cells, you can be in trouble from that. Um, it will, if you don't have ACTH, how can you release cortisol and the adrenal androgens? You can't. Um, so you will become deficient, and that's called Addison's disease, or primary adrenal insufficiency. So we'll see here in a second. Um, also, the if you don't use it, you lose it. So the zona fasciculata and zona reticularis of the adrenal cortex will start to atrophy. Aldosterone is not affected. How come? It's not, well, it's affected a tiny bit, but in general, it's not affected. How come? Well, because we said uh, ACTH doesn't bind to glomerulosa cells to cause the release of aldosterone. A little bit, but not enough. It's, it's potassium ion concentration uh, and it's angiotensin II, which drive the release of aldosterone. So your aldosterone will be spared in these conditions. Um, this, where you get a pituitary tumor and it messes up the release of ACTH, that's called secondary adrenal insufficiency. All right, so adrenal insufficiency, there's JFK. There's always rumors that he had adrenal insufficiency because of the, uh, specifically, that would be primary adrenal insufficiency. Because in secondary adrenal insufficiency, you don't get the tan look here, right? Because there's no ACTH. Primary adrenal insufficiency, the problem is the adrenal gland. And you have high levels of ACTH, which could drive those melanocytes at MSH2 and that whole mechanism there. So let's go, to, let's talk about it. So adrenal insufficiency, also known as hypoadrenalism, first described by Thomas Addison back in the day. 
Um, and that was considered the birth of clinical endocrinology was this adrenal insufficiency. Uh, and adrenal insufficiency is defined as a failure of all or part of the adrenal con uh, cortex to overproduce its hormones. All of the hormones, like cortisol, aldosterone, DHEA, collectively you can call those the adrenal steroids. Don't confuse those with the adrenal androgens, right? Those are the DHEA, DHES, androstenedione. Those are the um, adrenal androgens. Okay, the adrenal steroids are all, the everything that comes out of the adrenal gland. And yeah, adrenal insufficiency can be life-threatening, especially primary adrenal insufficiency. Um, and you could go into yeah, adrenal crisis and um, all sorts of things we'll get to. But it can kill you. Uh, cortis, cor, glucocorticoids, cortisol, and the mineral. Who's the mineral corticoid, by the way? That's aldosterone. Those are essential for life. You can't live without those. Uh, no adrenal steroids, you go into hypovolemic shock, hyperkalemia, acidosis occurs, hypogalemia, uh, hypoglycemic shock can occur, uh, and death can occur very quickly within 3-14 days unless, uh, unless you get some uh, replacements. So there's two types of adrenal insufficiency. There's primary adrenal insufficiency and secondary adrenal insufficiency. And let's work on primary adrenal ins insufficiency, and we'll talk about secondary and finish up this discussion of adrenal insufficiency next week. But let's start primary adrenal insufficiency. So this is the triple A, three A's, primary adrenal insufficiency. Um, that's Addison's disease. Everybody knows Addison's disease. It starts with an A. That's one of the A's. Um, it's a problem with the adrenal cortex itself. It's not a problem with the pituitary. And the problem is usually an autoimmune attack. So there's your three A's. That's how I remember this. But primary adrenal insufficiency, the adrenal gland is messed up. It's pathological. Usually from an autoimmune attack. Could be from a bug invasion like tuberculosis. Could be from a cancer invasion. The adrenal gland is messed up from some type of pathology. Prevalence is rare. It's about like Marfan syndrome, a 0.01% of the population. And in this disease, the reason this is such a bad disease is because both cortisol and aldosterone are out. You need those two to stay alive. Secondary adrenal insufficiency, aldosterone will still be around. And we know that aldosterone can bind to, uh, can bind to cortisol's receptors and have some effect. So it's not quite as devastating. Uh, but primary adrenal insufficiency is very, very dangerous uh, because you don't secrete cortisol or aldosterone. So there goes your blood pressure. There goes your sugar, and um, not good. So, yeah. So typically, all the adrenal steroids are not released. Again, it's usually caused by an autoimmune attack. Second place is an infection. Worldwide speaking, an infection. Like tuberculosis is probably the most common thing. Um, so if it is caused by an autoimmune disease, some give it the name auto, uh, some give it uh, the name um, autoimmune-driven adrenal insufficiency. 85% um, of the time, if you're going to get an adrenal insufficiency, it's going to be because of this autoimmune attack against 21-hydroxylase. Um, therefore, some call it autoimmune adrenal insufficiency or autoimmune adrenal adrenalitis. You should know those AKAs. You should know autoimmune adrenalitis is an AKA for primary adrenal insufficiency, which is an AKA for Addison's disease. A for autoimmune. Okay, there's the three A's we talked about already. Um, who is the target of the autoimmune attack? We already said it's 21-hydroxylase gene. 
if you can't make 21 hydroxylase, you can't make both cortisol and you can't make aldosterone. You still can make you can still make the adrenal androgens, but those aren't going to keep you alive. Those aren't when it comes to staying alive, those are not important. So who cares? Um, I mean, and that's controversial. We'll talk about next time whether you even need to do replacement adrenal androgens or not. All right, uh, here's the pathway. I don't need to go over that again, do I? But again, there's 21 hydroxylase. Take that enzyme out. You can't make aldosterone. You can't make cortisol. But you can still make DHEA and androstenedione and testosterone and, and such. And no, you can't. This is a one-way step. The CYP17 can't go backwards. So you can't take androstenedione um, and make 17-alpha-hydroxy uh, progesterone. Uh, and even if you could, that's not going to do any good because you still need 21-hydroxylase to make cortisol there. Antibody testing for Addison's disease. Kids it works great. Adults it doesn't work. Um, so in kids, if you suspect the kid has Addison's disease, you can order a test, uh, an antibody test for Addison's disease. Super high, highly specific. Specificity is almost 100%. Um, so that means the rate of false positive is unheard of. If you test positive, you're positive. I think the sensitivity is in the low 90s. So it's a good test. In adults, it's terrible. The specificity is only 50%, so it's not really even worth giving to adults. But it looks for antibodies um, that are against 21-hydroxylase. So they're called 21-hydroxylase antibodies. Concomitant disease with Addison's disease, so the autoimmune type of Addison's disease, 50% uh, of the patients with Addison's have type 1 diabetes. Usually comes first. They get Addison's disease later. If you have an autoimmune attack against one tissue, why not have it against another? And this happens. Hypothyroidism. Uh, vitiligo. We'll talk about that more in seventh quarter in dermatology. Rheumatoid arthritis. Pernicious anemia. These are all common. Have to be looked out for if you get the diagnosis of Addison's disease. How about non-autoimmune Addison's disease? Um, yeah, we said that can also wipe out the entire adrenal gland, um, whether it be from bugs or cancer or, or, or what have you. Okay, uh, The infectious cause, we said tuberculosis uh, loves the adrenal gland. In fact, it, there's a tuberculosis adenitis which is still a primary adrenal insufficiency, but instead of autoimmune attack wiping out the adrenal gland, now you have a bug. You have tuberculosis wiping out the, uh, damaging the adrenal gland so it can't release its juices. Worldwide, again, this is the most common type of Addison's disease. Worldwide, other bugs, uh, AIDS, uh, can also uh, why hit the adrenal gland, cytomegaly virus, histoplasmosis, other creatures can also get into the adrenal gland infected and cause trouble. There's also non-infectious causes of primary adrenal insufficiency uh, or Addison's disease. So metastatic disease from prostate cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, um, that can all go the primary cancer would be in the lung, but it can get into the into the circulatory system and float around in the body, and it loves to stick to the adrenal gland. Um, hemorrhagic, you can get, especially people on blood thinners, you can get some of the adrenal arteries to pop. Maybe they had a little aneurysm and they burst, and that will cause ischemia and kill the adrenal cortex. That could be another side. Or maybe you get an embolism, an arterial embolism, or a venous embolism, uh, where it causes ischemia. And uh, if you don't have a blood flow to the adrenal cortex, it's not going to work. right? So th those are other pretty darn rare causes. What are the blood work findings in someone with primary adrenal insufficiency? 
again, primary uh, means that there's nothing wrong with the pituitary gland. So there's nothing to shut off the production of ACTH. In fact, ACTH is going to be overproduced because there's nothing to turn it off. So keep that in mind. Uh, but it depends which, which cells are taken out in the adrenal gland. If it's autoimmune, it usually takes out uh, the, the, the aldosterone and cortisol. Um, so uh, you'll have hypercortisolism. You'll have hyperaldosteronism and its sequelae. We've already talked about aldosterone. If you have decreased aldosterone, you'll have hypotension, can't reabsorb salt and water. You can't kick out hydrogen ion and potassium ion into the filtrate, so you have hyperkalemia. Um, you will have acidosis. You'll have hyponatremia because you're not reabsorbing salt like you're supposed to be. High of hypotension because you're not reabsorbing water like you're supposed to be. You'll have increased renin levels because of the hypotension. How will your ACTH levels be in primary? There's the board question. There's my question. How will your ACTH levels be someone with primary adrenal insufficiency? They're going to be off the chart high, super high. And you can measure CRH levels too or ADHP levels. They'll all be high because there's that double negative feedback system works with cortisol and cortisol is not being made. See how that works? The adrenal androgen levels, how will they be? They'll be normal. Right? Androstenedione levels will be normal. All right. Um, some more classic symptoms. Some symptoms are mysterious and we don't know. Uh, like GI symptoms. Patients will go to the ER with nausea, vomiting. They'll, you'll think maybe they have appendicitis or a small bowel obstruction. Um, and we don't know the mechanism why that is. Um, they all lose weight, usually because of GI symptoms. I mean, if this goes on and on, they become anorexic. Right? They don't want to eat because of the, the GI symptoms. Hyperpigmentation occurs in 94% of them. Hypotension in 90%. So these are all very common symptoms. All right, so next time we'll continue our discussion and we'll get into... Uh, secondary adrenal insufficiency. All right, see you later. Email me those questions.